Lachlan Morton, the man of the hour. Congratulations on a massive weekend. Um, you're home. That's a very yeah. exciting place to be. How long? How long have you been home? Uh, I got home really late last night at about one a.m. Um, you know, standard delayed flights and everything. But uh, it's so nice. Yeah, wake up at home. Yeah, uh, and you know, just like that return to normalcy is really um, something I I enjoy like a lot, and like increasingly, I think as I get older. Um, uh-huh. it like, it's like very, very important to me. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm stoked, you know, like looking at the backyard at the long grass and everything I've got to do, but, um, it's not a, it's not a stress. I'm like, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> stuff to do this so it's yeah. Good. Yeah. We've got 10 acres of largely grass. Um, 10 acres, Damn. 10 acres. So yeah, we're two acres, uh-huh. uh, and that's already like, um, it's more than you think. You oh, know? Gosh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And mm-hmm. I think realistically about three or four acres are mowed. I had grand ambitions of getting a giant tractor and doing a lot of my own maintenance. And I'm like, <laughs> nice. I don't have enough time to ride my bike, let alone maintain the yard. So, uh, yeah, like I grew up, uh, we had like a hundred acre oh, like wow. farm. Uh-huh. Uh, so I would say probably 30 acres of that um, had to be mowed every week. Oh, geez. And, but we had like the big ride on, you know, and it would just be split between my brother, uh, dad, and I. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know that game, and <laughs> I'm trying not to get sucked into <laughs> having too much, yeah. too much mowed area. But I'm also realizing that like a ride on mow is a lot easier than a, uh, like walking around with a whipper snipper. Oh, so like, okay. yeah. Anyway. Um, nice. So yeah, traditional, traditional world tour format. And I suppose this has come to gravel is like, regardless of how you do after the race, you could win the thing. You win Perry Roubaix or you can get last place and you're on a flight and you're going home. Right. What, what did the subsequent, here we are on the Thursday after unbound. What did the next five days look like? Well, four, like you flew in last night. What'd you do in the days yeah. afterwards? Uh, so my parents live in, uh, in Boulder in Colorado and that's where I was based, you know, on and off the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and Tom Hopper, uh, my mechanic trying to do it all, man. Um, he's also in Boulder. Yeah. So I flew into Boulder to drive like down to, I'm down with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, day after the race, we packed up the, the camper and, um, yeah, just jumped on the road and head back to, back to Boulder, which like, it's kind of nice that, that drive where you just sort of, it was just him and I, we could kind of like chat and yeah. tell our own little stories from the race, you know? Sure. Uh, and cause it's crazy. Like you forget, I mean, on a day like that, right. You're so into what you're doing. You forget the chaos of like, you know, someone trying to get to different aid stations and all the different things that happen, uh-huh. you know, um, so they've kind of had an equally hectic day. So we, yeah, we had a, <laughs> had a catch up, you know, uh, got home that night, got to see my wife, Rachel, she was in Boulder, uh, and my parents and yeah, we just like ate some pizza and hung out. That was nice, you know, yeah. um, like, and then the next night we had a, a barbecue with some friends um, like, you know, different people from Boulder who were around, but, uh, yeah, just like low key. That's kind of like my ideal sort of celebration, you know, yeah. just like you just cook some burgers and drink a few beers and, uh, it's like, it's just like a catch up, you know? Sure. Uh, yeah. And I also got like a new mountain bike that I've been waiting for for ages, the new uh-huh. scalpel. Oh, um, sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Tom and I had been talking about it the week before and I was just like, I can't wait to get back to Boulder and like be able to try this thing out. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, then I just kind of spent the days out on the bike, uh, in like, you know, it's a nice Colorado this time of year, just like getting out there, a couple of mates on the trails and mm-hmm. enjoying that, you know, um, mm-hmm. it was pretty, it was a pretty nice, you know, few days, 
uh, ultimately, like, pretty similar to what I'd do anyway. <laughs> I'd want them to, you know. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, yeah, it just gets more challenging in that, like, you kind of have to... Um, I'm not good at, like, uh, saying no, generally. So they can get, like, a lot of different requests in that. But uh, this is the only podcast that was like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> you know? uh, Otherwise, I'll just it. out my bike. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, flew home, uh, and here I am. So it's nice. Like, it was pretty – it wasn't, like, some big wild celebration, you know, right. ultimately, like – um, just like the the day in itself was was enough. <laughs> sure, yeah, it is. Um, it's cool that they make it a whole weekend affair. I mean, into Sunday, mm. it's nice to stick around into Sunday. Um, whole handful of things. One, yeah, when I was living in Girona, Tom Hopper was one of my best friends. He's <laughs> he's he was dating Ali at the time. He's such an amazing dude. So. Yeah, yeah, I can appreciate easy, easy that kind of time. Um, unintentional making it a Cannondale advertisement. Same thing. I had a Cannondale Scalpel SE. Like nice. the slightly more slack, a little more travel. I built it up. Yep. I proudly built it up myself. Like I can do basic stuff, but there I was bleeding brakes. So yeah, first, nice. first yeah, three rides. Yeah, a different beat. Oh man, <laughs> so much fun. Um, so... Okay, there's there's plenty more at Unbound that I want to unpack, but let's go back to to the very early days. Um, tell me a bit about your upbringing outside of sharing some lawn mowing duties with your brother and dad. <laughs> Obviously Australian by birth. What? Wow, yeah. What is life like on a hundred acre farm? And at what point do you ultimately <laughs> get into cycling? Uh, yes, yeah, so I grew up just outside of a, a small town called Port Macquarie, which is like a coastal town. Uh, between Sydney and Brisbane. Yeah. And, yeah, so we were about uh, 10Ks inland. Um, and, yeah, I grew up there, like, you know, the nicest kind of childhood you could imagine having. We had a lot of space. Um, we had bikes. We had motorbikes. Um, and, yeah, just like, I guess, just through that lifestyle, we always spent a lot of time outside. Um, and we were very into, uh, motor racing Like my dad raced cars oh, wow. uh, <laughs> and we were like, just kind of inherited that, uh, obsession as young kids, you know, started on motorbikes and there was a, a go-kart track that got built, which was a big deal. Um, so the plan was we were going to start go-karting, um, and get into that but we had like family friends who were lived just up the road and had uh two boys like similar age to Gus and I uh, and we were like hyper competitive and their dad was also a car racer <laughs> um so like they wanted to split us up so we wouldn't be competing against each other <laughs> so they started go-kart racing and then uh we got bikes uh as like something you know to do for for that year sure and did it just like uh evolved really quickly because like i'm gonna start there was a really strong cycling community in port macquarie uh which is kind of pretty rare for you know like a smaller town i mean it's a bigger town now but at that time it was weird to have you know, a hundred people who would show up to a club race, Oh wow! you know, every yeah. week. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it just, uh, we started going to the club races. Uh, my brother was, you know, really good and that kind of dragged us in. And then I was the younger brother, like trying to emulate the older brother. Of course. And yeah, in that, uh, through that process, we, ne- we never went go-karting and just like, went you know all in for for bike racing um and it was like exclusively road racing uh we did like a bit of track and initially it was just like the fun thing to do on you know in in summer they had like a tuesday night brit series in town 
And then in the winter, it was like a Saturday afternoon handicap race. Um, and we'd just kind of do that. And that was the extent of it. But then when we went on a, like a big family trip to Europe, uh, when I was, I think 11, um, and as part of that, we saw, uh, the Tour de France. We were like, we were in, uh, Toulouse. Yeah. And then yeah. we saw a stage there and it just like blew my mind, you know, like the, the fact that I was like, man, this weird thing I do at home, which is weird, you know, like there's no, <laughs> no one else at school doing this. Like, yeah. Like riding I was like, it's a whole thing here. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that was just like a switch that flipped in my mind. And from like that age, I was like, okay, I know what I want to do. And then, you know, started training, uh, and just trying to win any bike race I could really Yeah. <laughs> until, you know, uh, you, you kind of win a state title and then a national title. And then we started doing some racing in the U S and then just through that process, I, I got onto the like development team of, of Garmin at the time or Chipotle. Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> um, anyway, just like very standard path. And by the time I was 20, I was like a, World tour. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're quasi American. You're semi American. I mean, having, having lived in Colorado for as long as I've known, um, with the exception of recently moving to California, uh, what's the story there? What brought you to Colorado? Was it purely bike racing? Like your, your, your folks live there now. And then maybe a, yeah. a supplement follow up. How was it that you raced the U S national championship? As a junior. <laughs> yeah, so we, like, uh, Dad had, like, a, a startup magnetics company um, in, in, like, based out of our place in, in Australia. Mm-hmm. And they, he was, like, busy trying to build this business. And uh, it became, like, apparent, I think, for them, they needed to be based in the U S if it was going to work ever. Okay. Uh, and so they started spending time there and we would kind of piggyback those to do like bike racing trips, you know? Uh, so like we might spend like four weeks in the U S summer based in Colorado racing. Got it. Um, Got it. And, and then, yeah, the reason I moved was essentially like I, as a, when I finished high school, you get like, a grade, you know, like it's like, you know, <laughs> summarize the previous a decade into one grade. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then that grade out of a hundred determines what you can go and study. Uh, so if you get 98, that's like, okay, you can go and try and be a doctor. Yeah. Um, and I did okay, like better than I thought I would do because I didn't have like a huge amount of interest in school, but, yeah. um, it's like better than I thought I would do to where I was like, okay, it was, it was very much like a, crossroads and I had the chance to either go and race with this development team based out of the U S or like go to school. Yeah. Uh, and you know, at that age, you just like, what's more exciting. Yeah. Racing bikes. Uh, so yeah, I like moved over there and then my parents, like, because I was, you know, the last kid in the house, um, they, they finally were like, okay, we can also move to the U S full time and, and start like establishing their, their business there. Um, and yeah, I just like was there for two years racing with that team. And then we started doing more racing in Europe and then that kind of led to, uh, me basing myself in Europe you know, during the season. And then as you kind of go into a world tour program, you have to be there, but I always would come back to Boulder and, and Colorado just generally. Yeah. Um, cause I liked it, you know, sure. uh, like sure. we didn't, we didn't have like mountains where I grew up. And so all of that was just like, so cool and new and exciting. And, um, that became home, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Colorado's an amazing place. 
whether you ride a bike or not. And that also explains yeah. its gravitation and its wild popularity and population. And we basically, yeah. my wife and I were living in the Bay Area, California, and we we're considering where to go next. We'd spend a ton of time and I have family in Colorado. I'm like, geez, it's not really a downgrading by population or city structure because at this point, Boulder almost feels like a mini San Francisco. It's crazy now. Yeah. yeah. Last yeah. week, I was like, just sitting, you're sitting in traffic. I was yeah. like, what, when did this happen? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Big time. <laughs> just like, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you, you've, you've hit on it. You're, you're having success racing. You, as long as your Wikipedia page is right, you win Libidaby, which is no small feat. You get yeah. identified by Vodders, who I think does a great job of talent identification. You end up doing three years with, with the strip, Slipstream program. Mm-hmm. And then if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you nearly step away from cycling entirely. Yeah. Before going to Jelly Belly, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had like a, a tough transition there. Like when I finally became a world tour athlete, um, I think like, like I said, I had a really smooth run into it and I could always, I didn't mind training hard. Um, and like had, had enough ability that, I mean, I'm I'm not going to say it came easy. It's, you know, it's always a lot of work, but like everything flowed to a point where I wound up as that, that bike rider that I'd like dream to be or in the position. Um, yeah. And was like very unsatisfied. Um, and sort of would ride this roller coaster of performing well and being like, okay, everything's great. I love my life. And then performing poorly and being like, Oh my God, I'm miserable. You know, I have no real friends. I'm on the other side of the world. Yeah. Uh, and it was just like, a. It was a tough uh, period. And I, I think like a lot of it was, I wasn't mature enough to, to deal with it at that time, you know, and you don't really have uh, a, a like wider view to kind of look at your situation and be like, damn, this is a pretty sweet job. Um, so, and, and the way I would go about things at that time, I was like really effective as an athlete, if I like isolated myself, uh, you know, for, for training or whatever it was, I was just like, that's easier if I just like remove everything yeah. and then I can just do my thing. And I know then I'm good at races and then that, that takes care of everything. Um, which like, yeah, in hindsight, the rest of my life was just kind of eroding, um, like all the relationships and everything else I had. And and then I finally, like, I, d- I did one year in the world tour and then I was, I had a few, like, I, I did well at the end of that year. And then, the, like, even when I would do well, that feeling, you know, wasn't enough. Uh-huh. Um, and then I did, like, a really big bike ride with my brother in Australia that off season. And it was, like, a real... Um, I just was finally removed from that world enough to kind of take a snapshot of where I was at. And I was like, I don't think this is a healthy spot, yeah. you know, to be in. Yeah. Um, and then I, I did the next year as a world tour rider in theory. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was stumbling through and like, you know, I like, I remembered before I was supposed to do, well, I did tour of Romandy, but like I was out riding the, the week before and I was like, oh, I need to go home. And I just like booked a flight back to Australia and went back to Australia for like two days and then flew back to Romandy. And, like, no way. I was just, yeah, I, I was, I was not, uh, <laughs> I was not in it, you know, um, at all. And that was like, that was, I would say, the toughest year I had, you know, because I was there by myself. And yeah. um, where were you living? Again, were you in Girona, or I, I was in Girona at yeah. that point. Um, which at that point it was also a different place than it is now. But I think yeah. mainly it's like I was very different, you know, and I don't think there was there was anything I could do at that time. Like everything that happened was ultimately 
uh, my own doing, you know. I wasn't in a bad team environment, you know. I wasn't, like, yeah, without the opportunity to, to socialise and, and make myself happier. But it's just I, I was so far down the wormhole that, like, I was like, I need to get out of it out of here fully uh, <laughs> because uh, there's too many habits and memories and yeah. whatever that are just like festering here for me. So yeah, I did that year and then uh, was pretty set. I was like, I think I'm going to stop racing um, and try and do something else. Uh, and then and my brother who had been, a successful bike rider had been through that process. Yep. Um, and so it was super helpful. And I, I was also like, damn, okay, I, what will I do? Right. <laughs> right. Know, like, I did, I hadn't had time like enough in the, in the real world to, to know what my interests were outside of bike riding. And I was so accustomed to that being the way one, I made a living, but also like so much of my identity was wrapped up in that. I was like, I don't, I think it would be too much to just leave it. You know, I think I'd be fully lost. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. my brother was also like, he'd gone, you know, into film and was working on a TV show in Australia. And he was having like a similar sort of, um, moment of like questioning his path a bit. Yeah. And so, like, together we just schemed. We were like, okay, what if we could both get on, like, a US team or just race together? Yeah. And at this point, Gus hadn't raced or ridden really his bike for probably three years. Uh, and um, somehow we got in contact with Jelly Belly and Danny Van Hout and Matt Rice, who ran that program. Yeah. They were like, all right, we'll do it. We'll, <laughs> we'll bring both arms. Oh, my uh, God. And so that became, yeah, the, the plan for the next year. We're like, all right, we'll do this. This will be like a nice transition. We can race both of them in Boulder. It'll be fun. Yeah. Um, and, and like then, yeah, we just started having so much fun on that team uh, because it was so like, it was just a little family. It was like a group of, group of guys on the road, you know, like doing the host housing thing. and Sure. Just like... Everyone just loved it, you know, like purely for for the love of bike riding. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like racing in the US, the calendar's it's not so extensive that you can't do a bunch of things outside of that. So we started doing more like bikepacking rides and, you know, just like things that helped us discover more outside of racing um, and that really like made me appreciate the that lifestyle you know to, and I was like okay I think I want to do this yeah uh, and so we did another year and I was one of I was like okay I want to like have a crack at you know Utah and Cali and these races and just in that environment it all clicked really well mm-hmm. and you know we won a bunch of races yeah and like it we just had <laughs> had a lot of fun you know, um, which, yeah. yeah, it was really rewarding. It was, it was very different than when I tried to win races before. It was very much like a whole group of us, yeah. you know, committing to something. And then we started to realize like, oh man, we can pull off some pretty cool wins, <laughs> you know, um, like as this small little group of guys on the road. <laughs> so, sure. Um, yeah. And then that kind of led to, an opportunity to race in the world tour again and I was very I got that was a again like another moment I was like do I want to do that like am I ready to do that um, and ultimately I kind of realized I was like I think if I don't go back knowing what I know now I'll just regret it you know forever I was like let's just go and do it for a couple of years and if I go back and it's not what I want, then at least it's put to bed, you know, um, from like a more mature spot than just like kind of throwing a tantrum and being like, ah, I'm leaving, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like I, I just found a groove with, with Dimension Data and um, at this point, Rachel and I were married and her being there 
we set up like a proper life in in Girona and it just um, you know it made the world difference yeah to be in Girona married versus unmarried can make for a very uh, fun experience or a very lonely experience and right. it's not necessarily mutually exclusive to the status of totally. the relationship so yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine that being very special you go back in 2017 that's your first year with Dimension Data yeah which yeah. is what seven years ago now so at that point you're in your mid 20s right mid late 20s yeah yeah um, I think that's 26 yeah. 25 maybe I so then I mean I'm unintentionally going through your chronology but let's let's continue doing that. At what point do you end up back on EF? I mean, is twenty nineteen is the the calendar answer? Is it? Yeah, I just like uh, Dimension Data. I had a lot of fun. It's a really good group of people, and I like found I found the groove of like, okay, this is how far I'm willing to go in terms of whatever training that kind of. Like, I was like, I, I'm only going to go this far to where I still enjoy my lifestyle. And then this is the kind of rider I can be yeah. because of that, right? Which, like, the group was, it's like I could be a good helper. And then, like, once a year, I could kind of maybe pull out something at like California or, like, you know. And for me, that was like, okay, it's a good groove. And, uh, and let me interrupt there. My first, Is that, yeah. like... I mean, anyone who races in the world tour has some kind of blinders on to the rest of the world, right? You, like, you have to focus. There's no one who's... Yeah. yeah. Maybe, I mean, Vanderpool could probably ride one leg and, and be perfectly <laughs> adequate. So, like... Yeah. Are you talking... What what kind of level of dedication are you talking about? Because I'm sure some people are like, oh, he's not willing to dope. And I don't think that's what you're alluding to at all. Oh, no, 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 no. More like... At that point, I think it was when... Uh, the science in bike riding really started to like come on strong, you know. And the um, three week training like when camps. I was, yeah, like and in, in when I first turned professional, it was sort of like okay, you just go and do like three by fifteen minute thresholds, and then do some sprints and a long ride, and it's like okay, yeah, you, you just show up and go for it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think it was probably as the sport cleaned up you know they went further into sports science um because they had to find other ways to make bike riders go fast yeah you know? yeah um, and yeah like that change like you could see the shift like in the two years i had away and then coming back you're like oh man this is uh like the training's more intense um like the Sky coming along, bringing marginal gains, all that. Everyone was kind of scrambling to keep up. Yeah. And um, I guess, like, at that point, I didn't mind doing the the training the way it was. Um, it was just, I was like, okay. I kind of would draw the line. I'm like, when I go out for a ride and then when I come back, I'm like, I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. You know? So, like, it meant, like, I'm not doing the the diet stuff like the everything else that like turns professional riding into like a 24 hour job I was like I can't do that um, from like a longevity perspective yeah you know yeah and I could turn it on for like a month a year if I had like a goal or some responsibility in the team at, like a race but then I was like okay that's this is my sweet spot <laughs> you know yeah um, and was like content with that and I was like oh, okay actually I think I could do this I could have a career doing this like this is sustainable and I was getting better at the the roles I had you know and I also liked not being a leader um, and yeah I had done my first grand tour with them was sort of like oh yeah this could be something I, I could be you know useful at or yep. build my seasons around yeah and then like right around then uh, Rafa like had they spoke I, I had a relationship with Rafa I think I, I used their shoes at that point and had a communication line with them and they were like oh we have this idea around like 
an alternate racing calendar. At this point, I was sort of doing like adventures with Gus, like in the off season. Sure. And um, it was like this kind of okay. I'll, I'll switch on to race. I'll do the, the other stuff that satisfies me probably more. Like you know when I can. Um, and then there was like this idea of like okay, we want to combine those things, you know, in a race calendar. Yeah. And they didn't mention who the team was at that point. Um, and again, it was like, I've just sort of like hit my groove here. Like this could be risky, you know, like I could commit to doing this and then it doesn't work. And then like, no one would take me seriously again. I couldn't come back and do this, you know? Um, yeah. And so there was like an element of risk, but I was also like, man, this could be really sweet. <laughs> like this will never happen again. Totally. Uh, and so I was like, okay, I committed to the doing it uh, with them before I knew who the team was. And they're like, okay, we've got EF now. Like, And so it all just, like, I, I got on the team essentially through Rafa, uh, you know, uh, and being like, you you can be the, the bike rider who does it. Yeah. You know, and that that first year, we only did, I think we did... Unbound, uh, Leadville. I did the uh, GB Duro like yeah, uh, yeah. ultra race, yeah. and then we did three peaks or something. Um, yeah. So it wasn't like an extensive program, and I was like, I want to do them all. Like put sure. me in, and then I would race on the road, yeah. you know, outside of that. Yeah, and yeah, it just. Uh, like I was having a lot of fun doing it and then I think like the team saw the value in what it was and it just like it's just like snowballed from there yeah. uh, and I've been like lucky in that I think as I started to yeah I guess like enjoy road racing a bit less because um, like that sport was kind of developing in a way that made it really difficult to like do what you had to, you know, as a professional athlete and still draw that line somewhere, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. And yeah, it, it's been nice that like I've had a space to like continue to sort of follow the, the things I want to do and still have like competitive outlets, but just have a, like a, a team sort of behind me where I can, as the years went on, just have more and more freedom um, to, like, you know, ride all kinds of different events uh, and, and routes and just, like, really be able to, like, be true to, like, the motivations I have. Um, yeah. Which I'm, like, oh, man, I'm, like, so aware of how, like, lucky it is. <laughs> I don't want to, like, ruin it, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 been like a cool and really fulfilling sort of journey. Sure, yeah, it's incredible. Um, speak to this to whatever degree you're comfortable with. <clears throat> the, the overall question is: What are the economics of Lachlan Morton look like? Meaning, do you sign a contract with EF and you're beholden to those sponsors, or do you have a lot of freedom in your own regard or uh, like- it's, it's evolved yeah you know um like those initial years essentially it was like a a world tour contract um and i think probably it was the first three years as just a standard bike riding you know contract uh which and, they sort of required you to do because if you're going to drop into a UCI race like you have to meet those exactly so i was still registered yeah uh, and <laughs> As as I started doing more and more like uh, like races outside of a, the the road calendar, yeah, um, I just started like obviously having less time to be have like a normal. So I, I sort of fell outside the road like program, mm-hmm. and then I just became for like a period there. I was just like the oh, we need someone, <laughs> you know, someone's and, injured. Oh, Lachlan. someone's injured. Someone's sick. <laughs> um, and so I would jump into these road races, oh, which man. 
initially it was fun and then eventually I was like, I, you know, it's hard to do this. Uh, and I think I kind of had the realization. I did the Giro in 2020 Yeah. about, uh, I think I'd done Badlands two weeks before or something. Year 2020 and, is insane. Like, okay, that's a COVID <laughs> year, but yeah right you did a like whole bunch the, of individual events and then you cap it off with the friggin october zero yeah but that was a realization <laughs> i was like i don't think this is this level is too hard to think you could just jump in and do these things and and have it be enjoyable yeah uh so at a certain point it, it was also like i'm taking up a spot on a world tour team that you know there's a 19 year old hungry kid who could do this job better and probably deserves it more uh, so, yeah, then it just, I, I still essentially have a, well, I'm, I'm like an EF employee <laughs> at the moment. Nice. Uh, that has been and, Yeah, beholden to all the same sponsorships, same partners. Um, I still, like, operate within the team structure, um, but I'm not a registered uh, writer on the team. Yeah. Uh, so that means I can't get thrown into anything, which is sweet. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, but yeah, it, it's like, uh, I couldn't go out and find a new, uh, bike sponsor or like, you know, I'm still doing everything within the team structure, um, which I, I, I like, you know, um, I'm aware within like, the gravel racing space or the off-road racing space, um, you know, the riders doing it independently like yourself, you know, it's, it's a huge job, um, which like, I'm, it's not lost on me. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I'm really happy with the situation I have, um, where I can really, hone in on the, the, the riding goals I have and, and, you know, whether it's racing, whether it's a route or whatever it is and focus entirely on that and not have to worry about, you know, um, you know, the relationship directly with the sponsor or the product you're going to produce for them, whether it's a film, or yeah. photos and that kind of thing, um, which, yeah, it, it, it's cool to have, that kind of support. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. So the segue to gravel mm -hmm. is, is part of your chronology. It's part of this conversation. I've, I've been saying it forever, right? Gravel is fluid. So, mm -hmm. so looking back at your first unbound 2019, that's five years ago. Someone like Keegan or, or, Pete or Dylan Johnson in the wind tunnel. I mean, they're, they're treating it very professionally and that's going to move the mm -hmm. sport forward. Yeah. I recognize I sound like a stick in the mud saying that we should keep it chill and, and you're in it for the vibes and a fun bike race, but yeah. any sport you could be playing darts. You can be playing basketball. You can be playing football. Every sport moves forward. Gravel cycling included. Yeah. So in your time in, gravel for the past half dozen years what are your what's your impression what's your stance yeah i mean i think it's like a weird duality right like the reason i wanted to be involved with like the lifetime series when it first started was you wanted to see uh the progression of a sport in a different way you know where young bike riders like i was you know, 10 years ago can have a racing outlet, um, and the chance to, to make, you know, riding their livelihood. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and the road had left like a big void there. So it, it started to attract a lot more bike riders. Uh, and also I think like once you've started racing in that scene, um, you realize like, man, this is a, a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and I think it was, I mean, from, from my, this is like from my perspective in terms of not my perspective on what I think is the ideal of the sport, but from the ideal for me within the sport was 
like those years where it was like, okay, we know we race hard, you know, I, like we show each other respect, but once we, sh- we, we pin the number on, we go out there, we race hard. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't, uh, there wasn't that bleed in from, I guess, like elite competition where, you know, um, marginal details become a lot more important. And it's like, I mean, if you look at road racing now, right, it's a, it's like an arms race, um, yeah. where it's like how many bottles can we get to the riders on the side of the road? So like, we'll buy two more cars, five more people, yeah. you know, to feed and like, I've seen the way that goes, uh, and that's like the fear, right? Uh, and then the other big one is like teams. You know, I've, I've always loved the fact you go into a gravel race, and even when Housie and I were both doing the lifetime series, I was like, we're not helping each other. Yeah. Um, so I liked that element that it was like, okay, you can show up uh, as ready as you'd like, whatever, but we're all just going to get out there and you have a fair race. And but, it's almost like, like a really good checks out. It's like a group ride, right? It's like you yeah, up, exactly. you beat each other up. Someone's going to yeah. cross the line first, and you're stoked just to be part of it. And yeah, that's the original yeah. vibes. Yeah, exactly. And it's like okay, there's a stop sign, like like a group ride. You're like this doesn't matter enough for us to blow this stop sign right, and right, not right, right. Car, right? Um, so <laughs> it's progressed like beyond that point, which I. I understand because uh, I had this realization earlier this year. I was like, damn, this is escalating. Um, and if you want to be competitive in it, you kind of, you just end up escalating what you're doing, right? Um, but you kind of see the approach of, of some riders before this race and you're like, wow, they're more professional than I've ever been, you know, even. But I also understand that. I had that part of my career, you know, I had that point when I had all the focus on performance and getting results and treating it purely as like a profession and then escaped that. Well, I I call it escape, but made it, made a decision to move away from that. But ultimately you can't like take that part of someone's career away just because I'm like, Oh, you know what? I don't want to wear it skin suit yeah. <laughs> you know like totally. um, so I think like it's going to continue to grow it's going to continually progress and the the elite part of the field is going to get faster uh, and you know there will be issues I think that arise with that with uh, you know safety road closures a bunch of things that weren't really a factor a few years ago because there was less intensity in it, sure. you know, and, and it, and it also, it mattered less, <laughs> I think, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so like for, I was thinking about, it, I was like the first time I did unbound, uh, how's and I crossed the line together and he let me cross the line first cause he was blown and I like dragged him around for the last hundred K. Yeah. And then they, they got the results wrong. Like they had Housie third and I was fourth. Yeah. And we're just like, hey, what? okay, whatever, you know? Sure. But like I was thinking, I was like, now the difference between fourth and third in unbound is huge, right? Yes. Uh, yes. And yeah, I think even the way you look at the way the race was raced this year, there was a lot more importance, I think, from the way people were approaching it in trying to get a top 10 or trying to just like carve out that result instead of just racing the race that was there. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had riders that, you know, they make that selection and they're like, okay, I need to make sure I don't get dropped here. Uh, or I don't, I'm not going to take the risk to, to win the race cause it's, it's important. Right. <laughs> um, so it's just like an interesting, and you know, I, I go back and forth between how I feel about it, but ultimately I'm like, okay, you the way I feel is just like my, my experience in it. So like the way I can approach it and it kind of goes back to that lesson I learned, you know, the second time around the world tour is it's like, okay, you just draw your own lines and then you got to be content with what that gets you. Sure. Um, 
Sure. So, yeah, I'm excited and interested to see how um, these events progress. And, like, it was kind of reassuring, you know, to hang out, like, at the finish line at, at Unbound hours later and you're seeing the people come in who would, like, have that equal stoke because, you know, they beat the sunset this time or, um, you know, they they just had an experience out there that they had and we realised, like, oh, I, I won and that was exciting and now I'm seeing that same excitement. So, like, it still exists, that that vibe, um, but I think it's to, to have that experience, you kind of have to decide you're not going to race at the front, right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's just a complicated question. You know, it's wildly complicated, and I feel a lot of the folks who are share a similar sentiment are folks like you and me and Ian Boswell who have already had another career, and this is mm. like super fun. And fun is first and foremost, as opposed to to your point, like the young kid who's trying to prove their their worth in cycling they have to look for marginal gains because they, they don't have a 10 year world tour career to, to lean back on. And this yeah, is their exactly. everything. And if they don't make it here, then shoot, they got to figure out something else. So, yeah. I mean, I think my biggest hope is it's, I mean, it's beyond us who are, you know, we've had that career. We've been around forever. We're at the tail end of it. And it's not ours to decide where it goes now. Right. You know, there's a new generation who, uh, pushing that level and the the one thing I hope is that there's a realisation amongst those riders that they get to decide the way it goes you know um, which is hard when it's so competitive you know um, but I think that you know there, there's, there's some riders in there who do have a, a lot of presence and can really dictate the way well, I mean, the future of it. Um, and again, it's not for me to say you should dictate it this way or that way, but just to be aware of the fact that um, they're, they're kind of leading the charge. Yeah, big time. I've been working my way through this theory on the spirit of gravel, right? I mean, it's <laughs> joked about it. Dylan Johnson has a great YouTube meme where he says, spirit of gravel, rest in peace, 2023. <laughs> and in being, you know, I was in Emporia for two weeks because I went from Gravel Locos to Emporia. I went to the, okay. I went to the Gravel Hall of Fame induction, and all four inductees talked about the spirit of gravel and how there are a lot of racers in attendance. And they're like, don't just look at the racers, look around. Like, spirit of gravel is bigger than just the people who are gunning for the win. So yeah, that's that's the masses. And then my takeaway from the event, the two asterisks are. It was good weather, um, yeah. and the winner yourself is somebody that people can really get behind. Those two things are great. <laughs> I feel like I feel like everybody up front in the race, the people who are racing, who are like, "No, Spirit of Gravel's dead." They loved it, right? So, yeah. like this new Spirit of Gravel is. It, we need to embrace the inherent competitivity. Like we're all into being competitive. Totally, we're yeah. happy. And the I, masses I'm are happy. You. I'm with you, and there was so much I took away from you know, the first half of that race yeah. Uh, where it's like, yeah, we are still like having a chat, having a laugh. Like we're still racing bar to bar. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. You know, when you look around and you're like, this is such a wild setting for a, an elite level competition. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you're like, yeah. Uh, you know, we're bombing down these, these tiny like farm lanes and there's rocks and like dust and there's a helicopter. <laughs> it's I know. Just, like, Dude, the, the helicopter. The thing's like, that cracks kind me. of absurd and cool. Uh-huh. Um, and but then like, occasionally there's like something that'll happen that annoys me, right? Where I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. Now there's like guys, there's someone riding the front now as a dom- domestic, you know? And I'm like, ah, oh, that would never happen. And so like some, there's like just key things that I'm like, if that takes hold, um, that'll change this whole environment, you know? But I think at the moment it's cool because it's like, yeah, you just you have a bunch of competitive like 
individuals who like to race hard mm -hmm. and there is still space to do it your own way. Like you can do it like Dylan and test everything and come at it from a very scientific approach. Yeah. Um, or you can be, you know, like Boz who just has always been Boz and he just races the same and yeah. somehow, you know, he's like still great. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and it's, I think, I think, yeah, it's cool that, because like in, in a, in a, a world tour team now, for example, like they don't even get to choose what wheels or tires they're running. It's, the numbers have been run, you know, right. or like, right. There's no space for that kind of creativity in, in a race, um, which, yeah, I think it's, it's fun. It's, it's different for sure. Like you said, but it's still very cool. Um, and yeah, crazy. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I'm not <clears throat> being asked, do I want to run a 62 or 64 tooth chain ring? Oh man. I don't think I could push <laughs> exactly. that to begin with. Um, I don't want to chew on this one too in depth, but you just hit on it. Like the question was going to be, what are your thoughts on teams and gravel? It seems like, it seems to me like that, 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 that is the gateway to purely road racing off road. And I think that's, a pursuit that I don't want sounds like you don't want. Yeah. And I think like, I understand from, uh, potentially like a financial perspective from, from different sponsors and for athletes, it can make a lot more sense and they can have that security totally. and kind of enjoy the, the support that I've been talking about. You know, I, I get that. Um, but I think like from a racing perspective, especially now, like it has so much potential to change everything um, that the racing I think will be less exciting, mm -hmm. less fun and probably weighted one way or another, depending on, you know, funding and, yeah. and support. So like it's, you know, I think like, for example, like, I hit off by myself with like 200k to go, right? I watched that first. Which one. like it seems like ridiculous if you think of it from like a road racing perspective, but like last year there wouldn't have been two people to chase, and then that would draw out favourites and potentially just make a, a longer, harder race from a long way out. Yeah, and that couldn't happen because there was you know some people to ride the front and chase. Um, which then ultimately, you know, brought, brought the race, well, kept the race controlled to a point where you already saw it play out more like a road event. Um, again, still miles from that. Mm -hmm. We were still like attacking with a very long way to go, but, totally. um, I mean, that was just like two riders kind of committed to that. Uh, so I, I yeah. That, and that, this is one I, I like feel strongly about and I'm happy to sort of say like I'd rather than not be teams yeah. um, but yeah again it's like how do you make that rule right. you know um, right. it's yeah it's tough yeah I mean two things one I'm completely with you I would prefer there not be teams I think I think one thing that I really like about the current state of gravel is every Every person who's there is a little persona, like who you <laughs> represent, who I represent, who Payson represents, who Keegan represents. Like, I love <laughs> that. And there's so much more anonymity if we're like, oh, yeah, so-and-so team with, oh, well, who is that rider? I don't even know who he was. Right. Um, and then the secondly, yeah, I don't know how much it was. I've thought about this a lot in the past 24 hours and anticipating talking to you. It was tactically what you were just saying, enormously smart to go off when you did, because it, up to that point, Tobin had been riding the front, and you knew that the next whatever, how long, however long he's going to make it, another sixty k, eighty k, hundred k, the pace of the pe group is only going to go so fast. So it could exactly. it could ultimately diverge, and okay, the six strongest guys, Matt Beers and and Keegan, say okay, let's go on this flyer and chase down, chase down Lachlan. Alternatively, it worked 
perfectly in your favor. So, yeah, it's almost like this mishmash of privateers and teams allowed it to be such that you got away. Like, was that so? The question being, how much of that was a tactic watching, okay, teams are entering this race and I need to jumpstart the teams here or jump over? Uh, the I mean, it was all on the fly. I didn't have a plan before the race okay. um, because I think, like everyone, yeah, it was that first time you looked at the start list and you're like, I have no idea what's going to happen here. Totally. You know, and you could totally. feel that energy from the second we took off and we were all fighting for like the first left-hand turn. Right. And it was like 320K to go. That was, Everyone wanted to be, all right, let's see what what happens here. Which is totally um, bonkers because as soon as you make that left, then there's nothing interesting for another 40K. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, you know, it was kind of reassuring to see in the beginning. I didn't think that the the Bahrain team would be able to like, uh, control the way people thought. Yeah. Um, just because it's like, you, you know, and I know coming from a road background, it takes you a while to learn how to race a gravel race. You know, there's a lot of different parts that, um, legs only get you so far. Mm -hmm. And you could see that play out initially. I was like, okay, that's, that's not a factor. Um, and then, you know, Tobin riding with Keegan, it, it made sense the way they were sort of going about it. Um, but in the back of my head, I was like, actually, I think this is just going to play into the the hands of the, the guys who come from a, a road background, you know? Like, I was thinking of it from a perspective of, like, Van Avermaet. And it's like, oh, this is playing out similar to a road race in it. It's controlled. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's still chaos. There's a lot of things that are very different, but... yeah if we wait until 50 K to go to start racing, it's like, what the hell am I going to do against Van Abermart? You know? Yeah. And it's like, what do we all have that those guys don't? It's like, well, we're used to racing really hard for like a long time. So the race needed to open up. Yeah. Um, that was like my thought, you know? And then in making that move, it was like, yeah, okay. I think we could create separation here. I thought the race was getting hard enough at that point that a group could, you know, get moving and similar to last year, if you have enough committed riders, you could ride with eight or 10 riders all the way to the finish line and then, and then race from there. Yeah. Um, but the thing that caught me out was then like Tobin was obviously still riding. I thought it was going to be human. And then Bowles was riding. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, I wasn't expecting that, you know? Um, and so then it was like a reassessment. And luckily enough, like the race is difficult enough in that, middle section to where it ended up just being like, okay, this is just rider versus rider. And the team dynamic didn't, didn't play a part. Um, but you know, that was in theory, like two riders. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, ima- ima- imagine if everyone has, uh, like a totem, you right. know, or th- then when they have like five, um, and then you have like a situation where, you know, you have like 300 riders on the start line and then there's like 50 finishing because everyone just stops at the feet or right. you know, right. like just so many different, um, it, it will continue to evolve, uh, in that direction. I think unless there's like decisions made, I feel like it invites tremendous danger if everybody has a tobin then what the assumption is is that i need to be have my tobin on the front and i'm riding second wheel and we're on a for all intents and purposes as a european goat path 20 feet wide yeah so yeah, everyone's fighting tooth and nail yeah exactly um and like you know i i get the way like it, it, it works now, especially with like Keegan and Tubman. I think they they're great. I like the way they go about it. Yeah. Um, and I think he needs Tubman now because it's like everyone. He's the one guy. You know, we're all going to beat him. So like, it's kind of fine that he has a teammate helping him because yeah. it's like we're all against him anyway. <laughs> you know, it's like he needs <laughs> he needs something. Uh, and. Yeah, I, I think I, I've always respected the way those guys race. Uh, but, yeah, like you said, once that escalates, um, what does it look like? Uh, which, yeah, I guess time will tell. 
You talked about Boswell riding. In my impression, having talked to him in the race, not necessarily so much afterwards. Actually, no, I did talk to him afterwards. I was like, early in the race, he said he wasn't feeling great. Mm -hmm. Granted, yes, he has specialized on his jersey, and he shares a jersey with the Matt Beers of the world. So he said it was sure to help out his quote unquote teammate and also just to light the race up. So they were not just mm. riding, you know, that's his, that's his MO. He's a totally. good, he's a bike racer. Yeah. My question being, you went on an early attack. I watched you roll away. Ultimately we catch you. I come to learn in reading articles. It's because maybe you took a little, uh, detour and detour. had to come back. Yeah. Did you, was your initial attack before or after Boswell was riding? Uh, before, yeah. So you go away, you burn some matches, you get caught. You see that the pace is only increasing and you still go on another flyer. Like you obviously had an enormous. Yeah. Pace. I mean, you know how that like, uh, like in hindsight, did you look at that first move and go, yeah, I wasted way too many matches there. Yeah. And that was probably when I was riding the hardest. Um, in the whole race with like that 20 minutes, but you were totally solo then too, right? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, just, you know, when you like, you start, you have this idea and then you see how it's playing out. And I had like a minute or a minute and a half or something. Yeah. And then you look around and it's headwind and you're rolling for a <laughs> you know, you're like, right. Okay. This was dumb, but I'm too proud to sit up. Um, <laughs> basically, you know, you're like, okay, yep. I could probably still save my race here, but nah, I'm just going to go with it. Oh, um, makes for a good. Story. And then, like, yeah, and I was like ripping down the hill, and there was like a tight left, and I was busy like looking at the road, and then you know, later the the wire starts beeping, and you're like. Oh. Damn it. Slow yeah. down, turn yeah. around, and we're in like the big, biggest gear. And then, like, I saw the bunch coming, and I was just like, okay, that was that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to surprise them and be like, hey, guys, here I am. Yeah, exactly. It would have been sweet if I would, like, I should have just waited. And you should have gotten off it. your bike, pretend you're a marshal, <laughs> be like, guys, turn here, yeah. turn here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> problem was that, that the helmet I had on, no one could not anyway. Um, the, yeah, and then, like, I know, you know, like, the, the hardest part of the race is coming then. Yeah. And um, the tactic in being off the front at that moment, you're like, okay, well, at least if the, the hardest part of the race happens behind, um, I'll be ahead for that selection. Yeah. But yeah. it's like, okay, I'm going to have to make that selection now, um, having trying to be off the front. But, yeah, I mean, it's like I was surprised when the group started to split up the way it did. I thought it was going to be – harder and I thought I was going to have to race more from uh, from behind and so the way I was riding the climbs there initially I was like okay you can make up a lot of time once you crest these hills um, that's normally how people get dropped in that section they go really deep and then the pace accelerates and then it's like yeah. three or four bike lengths and then they're just like can't yeah. do it um, so I was kind of like those first few bits I was sort of riding bit within myself and then I'd sort of make up spots as I went, you know, over the top of them and then be able to still close gaps and whatever. And then, uh, there was one point I was behind Matt and he was starting to leave the gap and I was like, Oh, what's he doing? And then he like swung out and I thought, I thought he was just like trying to save energy. Yeah. You know? And you're like, dude, what, what are you doing? Like now, like you're just going to make me close it cause you don't want to, and then he was like, he, he was like, I'm, you know, on the limit. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, race is on here. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, I, as we, we got out of that hard section, that's when it became more tactical and people watching each other. And then um, I was like, we need to keep the race hard and there were more people coming from behind. And then, you know, I was trying, Keegan was trying, uh, Matt was trying. There were a few riders who were sort of very active and then a bunch who were just content to follow. Yeah. And then uh, Chad made a move and I was like, okay, he's a good bike rider. Yeah. And not only, like, is he a really good bike rider, but he's a really good bike rider that probably only half of these guys are aware of how good he is. Totally. Exactly. <laughs> and I, he, as soon as he went, I was next to Keegan. 
and and no one followed him. And you know when it's like you attacked a few times, you're like, God damn it, why did they just let him go? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <you know? laughs> like he's he's stronger than I am. Just like follow him. Uh, anyway, <laughs> like uh, Egan, uh, yeah, Keegan was next to me at that point, and I was like, I don't think we should let him get very far. Yeah. Um, but at that point, I think we all had that frustration of you like, well, I'm not just going to chase for the these 20 guys sitting on, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a harder, harder section. I think Pete strung it out a bit. And it was one of the few times, like, after that little Egypt section where I was like, okay, everyone's kind of on the limit here. I think this is, like, a good moment yeah. um, to just, like, go all in. Yeah. And, like, you because all you need, you know, you just need, like, that five-second hesitation. Sure. Especially at that point of the race. Um, and, yeah, that's what I got. And I was like, sweet, got a gap. And then I was like... Damn it, Chad's up there with one on the rider, and they're probably a minute ahead. So I need to ride across to him. Like this is really going to suck. Uh, but I knew if I got to him, I was like, I think we'll win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which like seems like a ridiculous thing to say at that point, but yeah. just knowing, like coming from the dynamic in that group, knowing I was like, I feel good. Uh, Chad's super strong, uh, and then w- once I got to him and we started like you know, swapping turns. Like we're on the same wavelength. We totally. just were doing basically like five minutes on the front, yeah. five minutes behind. And uh, yeah, once I was like, it's going to take a very committed group to bring us back here. How long um, did it take you to, to bridge up to Chad? You said he was a minute up the road. Yeah. I couldn't Jeez. see them when I went. And then luckily there was like a, it's a harder section. You sort of turn right and it's like a grassy, uh, small road and it's like uphill headwind yeah. like a slower part um, which it kind of helps if you buy yourself a little bit you know because um, it's not super high speed Yeah. and once we hit that I, I could sort of see them I was like alright I need to just like absolutely max it and get across here Jeez. and it only took like probably maybe 10 minutes or so Yeah. Um, but that was like the biggest effort of my race for sure was getting there. Yeah. But then getting there, I, was like, I took a lot of confidence. I was like, ah, oh, okay. I'm obviously like going pretty good today. Um, yeah. And yeah, then yeah, we were just in the zone. It was sweet. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so you're working with, you work with Dennis Van Winden, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The last like eighteen months, I think. Yeah, is he? I'm not asking for specifics. I'm looking like, and maybe I don't know. Answer this to whatever degree you want. Also, has he done anything to really mix up your training as opposed to what you've done in years past? Um, and then also, I mean, to that end, like you're not doing a world tour training program anymore. You have to be ready for Unbound mm-hmm. as much as you got to be ready for, you know, Schwamigan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, like, the biggest thing uh, he's helped with is, um, like, reining me in when I need to. Yeah. Uh, And then also just, like, being more realistic with, like, okay, this is your strength, this is your weakness. Um, Occasionally we're going to have to work on your weakness, (laughs) you know, (laughs) even though it's stuff that I... I I would say, like, before I started working with him, I really didn't enjoy, you know, doing hard VO2 intervals and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and we had, like, a very good understanding and going into it, I was like, look, I don't really want to change, like, my lifestyle a bunch. I still want to enjoy, like, riding the way I do. Yeah. Um, so I kind of want the minimal input <laughs> and adjustment um, so like the he won't give me anything I really don't need yeah. you know so I probably add structure a couple of times a week and then you know if I have an endurance ride the it might be like 
just don't ride more than eight hours you know <laughs> like, like <laughs> you know like somewhere between five to eight but just like don't do more than that yeah. and so I'm like okay that gives me like some sure. kind of like framework yeah. um, but I'd say yeah, the, the thing that he's uh, implemented in my training is is just like that higher end and how, how to do that in a way that like I, I don't really I don't have an interest in knowing so yeah. <laughs> and also I don't really understand structuring it so I'd say that's the biggest input he's had uh, and also like uh, he's like belief in the ability to do it you know mm-hmm. like he was always like yeah yeah you can definitely win up there and I'd be like oh okay yeah maybe yeah. Um, but you know in the back of my mind I was like I, I don't think so but you, you kind of say it enough that you start to believe it yeah um, and yeah that's been that's been big you know um, but it's also I would say the the process of being uh, coached as like and, and just our relationship I guess as like a coach and athlete mm-hmm. um, it's always like a a fine tune you know um, because even earlier this season I started to buy into the, the training a bit more because you start to look at Oh, this rider's doing this. I need to be better oh, totally. in this way. Yeah, uh, and like the biggest point I noticed, I was like, oh, I got this wrong. Is like when you start to uh, design your ride around intervals instead of just fitting the intervals into a ride you want to do. Yeah, and like there was one moment that that switch, and I was like, okay, this is too far. <laughs> you yeah. know, I can't. I can't. I can't do this. Um, I need to like switch it up. And then, yeah, it's also like, I hate doing the lap button thing. Sure. Um, I hate like having to go up and down the same hill and do the same effort. Um, So finding ways to essentially achieve the same thing um, without having to do that he's been really good with. So I do like a lot of local races. Um, nice. I like, I go on the, the local group rides here. And for me that like ticks all the boxes, right? Yeah. It's fun. You get out there, you're still riding hard, but you're not like burning mental matches and you, you're doing it with other people. And um, Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's just it's a process, but yeah, I, I'm not like, uh, I'm not someone who's like, ah, oh, you know, like I hate uh, structured training or like you shouldn't do this or blah, 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 because everyone has their own approach, you know. Right. Um, and I, st- I still enjoy riding hard and I like the feeling of, you know, completing a workout that you didn't think you could do. Like there's, there's some things in there that are really nice in that like progression, yeah. um, but it's more just me being like, okay, these are the things I like. I need to do X to to enjoy the race. I want to, you know, enjoy. Uh, yeah. yeah. But for everyone, that's different. You know, I, I've met like so many uh, bike riders who genuinely just love that, like hard workouts and like seeing that, like, and they get so much out of it. But I don't hold anything against it, you sure. know, um, sure. because that's just like their process. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of embracing the means to the end, and it's all everybody's got different means to get there. So yeah, yeah, and and like the the mistake I was making earlier this year, I think, was it's the mistake that I made when I was twenty years old as well. When you start to judge your enjoyment based off what the result was, yeah, um, you know, and there were races I did earlier this year where you'd be like, oh, it was a shit weekend. You know, even though, you know, I had a lot of fun <laughs> doing it, whatever, but like, uh, you're so focused on the outcome that you couldn't even draw the positives from the process. Um, and so, 
yeah, in getting ready for Unbound, I was, I was like, no matter what, I want to get to the start line and be stoked on the month I just had anyway and getting ready. Yeah. And then, you know, we'll just let the race be what it is. So based on that, which is a perfect answer, mm. it makes me think... My question is, okay, you just did great at Unbound. What's next? And my 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 estimate is whatever's next would be the same thing whether you won or got 105th. Like, what is next? What do you focus on next? Yeah, I mean, it's so... It's funny that, like... Uh, yeah, it feels like obviously the few days after a race like that are different when you win and when you lose, right? Yeah, like there, there's no way around the fact that if it doesn't go your way, if like luck doesn't fall your way, or you, your legs don't perform the way you want, like in the days after a race, you're always happy or sad, or like you're trying to learn something from it, or you're just high fiving, you know? Um, yeah, and that's different. But the the funny thing is, the second I've like got back home I'm like now it's the same yeah you know so I'll go about like the next uh, race I have on my calendar is the crusher um, and I'm also like sweet that's like still five weeks away so mm-hmm. I've got like a few weeks of exploring more of like the new backyard and, uh, yeah. doing a bunch of riding that was you know inaccessible during winter and then uh, I'll just like slowly hone in for that race, you know, um, as it comes closer. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's, I mean, I, my, my process is definitely, uh, based around the day to day enjoyment. And it still doesn't mean I'm not trying to achieve something, you know, as an athlete each day. Uh, but I kind of just take the next day and be like, okay. I should take it easy at the moment, right? Yeah. I'd rather be out riding now, but I'm like, I know I should like take it easy. So yeah. how am I going to enjoy the most of this day? And then once I step into riding again, it's like, okay, how am I going to enjoy the process of getting ready most? Just focus on the next day. Um, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah. seems to work best for me, you know? Sure. Um, yeah. So... I watch a lot of bike racing, right? I still love turning on my app and watching the tour or the classics or whatever. And I feel like all of the, all of the British commentators and maybe McEwen and some Aussie commentators, they always, they use an expression that we don't use here in America, which is there or thereabouts, right? He's there or thereabouts. He's there or thereabouts. And to our uninitiated audience, it means they're referring to somebody who's always, who's always up there, but they're not winning. Yeah, or they're not winning prolifically, and I, I've been thinking about this in anticipation of talking to you. I mean, your first your first film was thereabouts, the one where you rode with yeah. your brother Gus, and it's also characteristic of your past half dozen years. Like you're always up there, you're not yeah. winning prolifically, but like okay, in any race, whether it is Schwamigan or Crusher or Unbound, it, I know you're going to be there or thereabouts. You're going to be in the top three, five, ten, guaranteed. Yeah. So that's what makes this unbound so cool. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it feels like you're knocking on the door, you know? Yeah. Um, that's been one thing I've tried to, like, I enjoy being able to compete in a lot of different distances and disciplines. And, like, that's for me um, super rewarding uh, rather than being, like, very specialized in in one area. Yeah. Um, a sprinter that's it yeah yeah and it's like you know when I started doing like ultra stuff um he's like okay I'm good at this so the the tendency is like oh should I just do this yeah you know um but like I I I prefer to just do one of those a year and then like um still just like be in people's way at Schwarzenegger, you know, just enough that they're like, God damn it. Like, wasn't he based in Colorado Trail last week? Exactly. Like, you know, just, just enough that. that you're like. <laughs> um, and I, I like I like being 
in the race, you know, um, like that's, that's the level I want to be at generally is like, I want to be good enough to be in the race. Cause yeah, I've been behind the race and it's never as fun. Um, so yeah, like I, I'm not like hell bent on that result, but it's, if you're up there competing in the race and being able to like, you know, show yourself in the front in a way that makes it interesting. Like that's like enough for me. Um, and yeah, to, to win is cool, you know, like, but it's just that it's yeah. like, it's cool. You know, um, it's not, uh, it's not this huge, like release or like realization. It's just like, ah, oh, sweet, but it can happen. You yeah. know? Yeah, it's not immediate off season. I did it. Let's yeah, rest yeah. for the rest of the year. Well, and it's also I know like I thought about it afterwards, and I'm like, well, I'm bound to have the biggest race I do anymore. Yeah, and probably will do ever again, right? Yeah, and so you're like, what did that change? You tick that box. Yeah, and so is it like okay now I can stop training so hard or now I can, I don't know, spend more time. On but I just realized I was like, ah, oh, I just want to keep doing the same thing anyway. Yeah. So like, I think that that's the, um, the validation of the way I go about things. And I'm like, okay, that's good. That is in balance, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if I'll go back to the 200, again but that's probably the only thing that might change um like i'll enjoy watching that maybe next year but um yeah i think that's kind of put to bed but yeah otherwise there'll be another race another thing to do it's funny you say that i did this was my sixth 200 and for the final i don't know 40 or 50 i'm like yep i had a good run I'm, i'm i'm content not doing the 200 again yeah yeah, it's interesting. It's just, and it's not from a place of like, oh, like this is too wild. Which is like, okay, I've done this now. Right. You know, um, I still like what the event is. I still watch it. Right. I might even still just go and watch from the side of the road. But right, my place in this is done. Um, well, and it's funny because <laughs> it was then two days later. I'm like, no, I want to go back. I want to do another two hundred. Sweet. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> You should. <laughs> I mean, you should. I feel, and I think the reason I say that is like, I had so much angst. I had more angst than like racing tour of Flanders at the start line. I'm just like, what the heck has this come to? Yeah. But then as soon as, as soon as we start sprinting for that left-hand corner, I'm like, all right, this is the part that I know what to do. I was nervous about everything else. This is the easy part. It's so true. Like the second you get in it, you're like, okay, yeah, this is, this is what I'm good at. And I mean, and that's the appeal of, that competition, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's the appeal of that race and that distance in particular yeah. is that it pulls on like everything you've learned through your whole career, you know, yeah. um, like there's so many things you've got to put together to make a, a good performance there that like, it's so satisfying, yeah. um, you know, and when you're in that moment, you're like, sweet, I, I can, I'm fit enough. I have the bike handling ability. I understand my equipment, mm-hmm. you know, like all those, all these things you're putting together in this like ridiculous chaotic scenario, you know, somewhere in Kansas. It's like, it, right. it's cool. Um, yep. so you should. And then how is it like, I'm, I want to ask you the question. Yeah. Um, cause you, you like stated that you want to go back there and be competitive, right? Um, well, like give it a good crack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, which is a similar, like process I went through when I started working with Dennis, right. Um, where I was like, okay, I actually want to be, I'm going to show up to these races. I need to be a little bit more prepared. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like in going through that process and then like having whatever outcome, um, just like what, did you get what you wanted in terms of uh, not necessarily a result, but like in the process of getting ready for it that you wanted? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it, it organized my life in the previous six months in a way that it feels so much more haphazard were it not for working with a coach. Like, you know, I mean, like I'm waiting for my daughter who's waking up from a nap to knock on the door and be like, you know, everything's so regimented Okay. and and regiment works well for us and it works well in preparation. So, I mean, just like, instead of the haphazard nature of like, Oh geez. Okay. It's not snowing. And I have two hours. Let's go for a bike ride. It's been more like, okay, I'm supposed to do a three hour ride. Let's get it done no matter what. Um, Yeah. Okay. It was a nice, it was a nice schedule that's, yeah. that has worked well. And whether I continue to do that, who knows? Right. right. And yeah, I needed yeah, to also appreciate that it's very much entirely the process and not the outcome. I mean, just purely like a one day mm-hmm. with so many stupid variables. It's like you get a flat at my, you know, look at Brandon Wirtz. He got a flat at like mile 15, you know, his race is over. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. Which like, I, I think, yeah, as long as you like, enjoy that process of getting ready for it. Like you can yeah. escalate it as much as you want. Right. 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 Yeah. You can very e- just, easily escalate it to the point of hating it. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a decision really. Totally. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. which, and sometimes it helps to have that one day that you're accountable to, right. You know, to enforce that process. But yeah. That's cool. Which is also wacky. I mean, let alone getting a flat a mile too. It's also occurred to me like, yeah, you can pour everything into it, but then be sick or yeah, like the stuff that can happen even before the <laughs> the start has gone off. So yeah, you can't be yeah exact, exactly exactly. There's no. I mean, yeah, I didn't. It's like having a day where it goes right, and because uh, I saw my parents after that. Mm-hmm. And my mom was like, "So what was it? Like, why? Why did it all? What was the thing? Yeah, you know. And yeah, well, there is no thing. You know, it's mm-hmm. like it was just the culmination of all the riding I've done since I was eight years old. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And it played out in a way that you know was advantageous to me, and you know I managed to do it. But it's like there wasn't. It wasn't like." Well, what drink mix did you use? Or like, you know, what's the tire? It's it's all these things. It's like a little bit of all more, but not not any of them. You know what I mean? Um, right. It's yeah. It's yeah. Interesting. It is. Um. All right. You are being exceptionally generous with your time. We'll wrap real quick with three very simple questions. You've ridden your bike in a lot of very interesting places all over the world. Hmm. One, what is your favorite place to ride a bike? Two, what is the number one place that you would like to ride a bike that you've never ridden? And three, living or otherwise fictitious nonfiction with whom would you like to enjoy a bike ride? Okay. Uh, place I haven't ridden that I would like to ride is probably Chile. Uh, I don't know what it would be like. I've had a look at you know, some routes down there, but I think that would be a really interesting place to ride. Yeah. Um, favorite place to ride. That's an incredibly difficult one. I think, um, I'm stoked with where I live now in Auburn. Uh, if I, like I have everything I want in terms of mountain bike, gravel, you can ride the road bike. Um, so at the moment I would say here, but, uh, Yeah, it, it's it, the the thing with riding bikes now is you can have a good ride anywhere. Sure, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, yeah. like there's especially with like you know Strava and Commute and all these things that you can just find the good rides. Um, yeah, but yeah, if I if I had a, a week free and I could be anywhere, I'd be here at the moment. Um, Beautiful. Anyone I could ride with. Mm-hmm. That's a really uh, great question. So I guess I'm guessing you probably want them to be somewhat accustomed with bike riding. Not uh, necessarily. It's bro- sort of the the last meal question. You know, who do you want to share a conversation or a rip and ride? Uh, probably Killian and Johnny. I'd love to 
pick his brain about all things. Yeah. You know, um, that's a great one. Obviously like wildly accomplished athlete, but it's just the way he goes about it. You're like, damn, how, yeah. how do you do that? Um, yeah, I'd say him. Excellent. Excellent answer. Uh, well, I couldn't call this any more timely. I hear a child crying. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, yeah awesome awesome catching up with you congratulations are in order again thanks mate it's been a it's been a pleasure talking thank you thanks mate